Uh, as I said, we will have five presenters in the session, and now I'm happy to give the floor to the first one uh, in the session, my co-organizer, uh, Tzafi Seba Eldran. Uh, she's a senior lecturer of modern Hebrew literature and folklore, a member of the Department of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at the University of Haifa in Israel. And her studies mostly concern the formation of cultural memory in Israel. And she's working now um, on the local characteristics and cultural foundations of Israeli humor in a variety of sites and genres. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. The COVID-19 outbreak began in Israel toward the end of February 2020. And much like previous crises and pandemics, it inspired a rich folklore which included an abundance of numerous means. Overwhelmed by the scope and variety of these narratives, I wondered, are people laughing now in Italy or Spain as well? What are they laughing at? And do these means also have a local nature? And what are their main functions in relation to previous crises? The opportunity to discuss these and other questions with researchers and collectors from around the world seemed exciting and intriguing and I wish to thank Anna, Lisi, and Christian for allowing this to happen. But I only have 15 minutes, so I'll talk today about one aspect of this rich cultural phenomenon, and that is its parodic nature. I will describe the main sources of inspiration and authority of the parodic means, as well as their characteristics and roles during the pandemic, and perhaps even beyond this crisis. I'll skip the evolution of the meme as a digital genre, a topic that most of you are familiar with and that will probably be discussed here later, and just say that its anonymity, spontaneity, and immediate distribution, almost without any kind of censorship, as well as the active position of the audience in shaping its messages, may explain the meme's censorious nature and its ability to reflect social resistance. However, the meme is also an integral part of social media, which is influenced by mass media and consumer culture, its templates and core frames of reference are generally American and stereotypical. As such, the meme can be associated with popular culture and simultaneously conceptualized as folkloresque, meaning, according to Michael Foster, as a cultural product that utilizes traditional characteristics and folkloric style in order to ensure its distribution. In other words, the meme's association with different and even competing types of discourse might explain its, its contradictory roles as both reinforcement and subversion of hegemonic discourse, a contradiction well expressed through parody. I also allow myself to skip the methodological part of my research, assuming we will deal with it extensively in tomorrow's workshop. I just say that I try to gather a comprehensive and representative selection of means from different groups in Israeli society. And the examples I will present today were selected selected from a collection of 2,200 memes compiled from mid-February until the end of December 2020. The memes were initially classified by date, which was a highly effective way to understand their roles. They responded to the tightening of restrictions, such as the education system shutdown or the requirements to stay within 100 meters of one home, but weren't related to new COVID-19 cases or to the growing numbers of the unemployed. The timing of the humorous memes may therefore indicate that they reflected public confusion and uncertainty combined with family and other psychological difficulties typical to the radical disruption in daily routine and not necessarily or directly the fear of illness and death. Now I can elaborate on matters of style and form. The largest category of humorous pandemic memes was par parodies. It included... Let's see, it, it included one, uh, 170 parodies about movies, TV shows, famous paintings, and more. 85 about children's books, movies, and games, and 95 about the reported routes of infected persons and uh, various reports and snapshots characteristic of the pandemic. The wide scope of the parodic meme is not surprising, considering the collage-oriented nature of the remixed meme and its reliance on mimetic templates that are essentially collective. Lisi wrote about it, and she can tell us more about it. In this respect, memes are similar to epitypes, local variations of interna international teletypes. They present a creative adaptation of shared cultural forms, and by that, 
they possess the reflective nature. Parody, according to Hachem, is not a matter of nostalgic imitation of past models. It is a stylistic confrontation, a modern recoding which establishes, establishes difference at the heart of similarity. The dual affinity of parody to cultural traditions, its selectivity and tendentiousness explains, according to Bakhtin, its polemic nature and allows it, as Piano suggests, to express intergenerational gaps and, sing and signal the exchange of canons. Hence, the parodic quote, whether that of a genre, literary war, character, or object, can be perceived as gesture and a mockery, idealization and resistance. This invites an examination not only of how and why this major genre ridicules its sources, but also of the sources themselves and of, cultural, and of the cultural index or database they reference. The sources most often quoted by the parodies were films, television series, and paintings. More marginal sources were popular songs, and even more marginal were brands, such as Ikea and Nike. The most popular films during the pandemic, the pandemic and perhaps regardless of it, were Star Wars and The Princess Bride, along with other science fiction and fantasy films. The most popular TV shows were Friends, The Simpsons, and The Muppets. These films had gained cult status even prior to the pandemic, whether by virtue of their popularity among internet users or their incoherence, an aesthetic aspect which allows them, according to Umberto Eco, to be easily appropriated to new contexts. They exert a unifying social power among users of social networks who can easily identify with and cherish them. According to Giselinda Clippers and also Trevor Blank, such references are also meant to allay the public by restoring tragedy to its uh, presumably rightful realm, the fictional film. Along with films and TV show parodies of classic paintings from the Renaissance period on were also quite popular, such as memes featuring the Mona Lisa. Such parodies were also a widespread phenomenon prior to the pandemic. The professional skills of the creators of these memes and the technological savvy stand out in this rich cycle of visual jokes. Combined with the appropriation of a widespread and highly esteemed international or at least Western canon, this demonstrates and expands the cultural capital, the knowledge as well as the competencies of social network users. Moreover, a common incongruity in these jokes is from juxtaposing the canonical and the mundane and it emphasizing the imminent tensions between popular and high culture. Such parodies, therefore, allow the Latin community not only to reappropriate non-digital canons, but also to preserve the distinction between communities and repertoires and enjoy the prestige that accompanies these artworks, as well as a sense of intimacy and belonging. As in previous crises, parodies of children with songs and games were notably, notably prevalent. These parodies were mostly based on books, almost half of which were original Israeli books. Previous scholars have already pointed to this focus as a means of relief in times of crisis. However, it seems to have fulfilled an additional function during the pandemic. Such parodies were especially popular in the second half of March, after the education system shutdown and the strengthening of quarantine measures. On top of parents having to remain indoors and keep their children occupied, Israeli newspapers were publishing articles about the danger of asymptomatic but contagious children, which led to the portrayal of children as dirty, dangerous, and fatal during this rich mean cycle. A separate cycle of parent-children jokes, which are not necessarily parodic memes, depicts the symbolic revenge of parents against ch the children, with the children for rent signs and images of children being tied up or thrown out. The unique contribution of parodic memes in this context stems from the fact that they not only express disgust, fear, and aggression, but also demand a high level of familiarity with children books, movies, and games. This aspect, which is further emphasized, which is further emphasized by the choice of familiar Hebrew sources in the Israeli memes, reflects a deep-seated, probably parental, ambivalence about childcare during the pandemic. 
and a need to balance the threatening feelings it evoked by images then point to the laughers' connection to the world of children and limit the target audience of the means. Two additional interesting types of parodies are those on the activity routes of infected persons, on situation reports and graphs published in newspapers, and parodies on time indicators and implements such as clocks, daybooks, calendars, forecasts, and more. Likely, parodies on different organizing templates of the pandemic reflect the need for clear maps and guidelines in times of danger and uncertainty, as well as their absurdity and the confusion and unease caused by the shifting data and guidelines disseminated by the media. Parodies on markers of time, which peaked relatively late in the first week of April and culminated with the New Year celebrations, were associated with a larger group of time-centered means. These include the personification of time as cursed time, comparisons between the present and past, or a future perspective of the present, and the aforementioned parodies of clocks, datebooks, date calendars, and more. These means portray time as apocalyptic or as time that cannot mark change, renewal, or movement. It is possible that much like Japanese parodies of calendars during the choleric epidemic, this cycle reflects a sense or fear of stagnation that both the pandemic and quarantine elicited in many. If, as Ulrich Beck argues, risk societies are characterized by the attempt to colonize the future, which marks the creation of all dangers, then the eliminating and defining time with then versus now jokes, jokes from the future or the personification of time, might lend meme viewers a sense of control however temporary and humorous. Finally, it is important to note that along with many parodies and prominent works of art, the pandemic also inspired parodies about distinctly Jewish texts from canonical, canonic Jewish literature. These examples do not represent a particularly large moon cycle, but did have a presence alongside jokes about Jewish holidays and Israeli TV shows. In these means, Judaism is treated less as a religion and more as a canon with cultural heroes that constitutes an important foundation of Israeli society, as well as a cohesive and comforting element at a time of collective hardship and struggle. The parodic mean cycles discussed thus far might indicate that the diverse index referenced by the pandemic jokes the source of authority and inspiration for meme creators and disse uh, disseminators was largely global, much like the common index among meme audiences prior to the pandemic. Such an index is based not only on citations from cult movies and popular TV shows, but also on the appropriation of non-digital repertoires, an appropriation that creates, according to Bourdieu, a position in the artistic field of production that we might call modern or postmodern iconoplasm. This position demonstrates the cultural capital of digital communities and contributes to their sense of togetherness in a time of isolation and loneliness. However, the use of this index appeared alongside the translation of American templates into Hebrew and their adaptation to the contemporary Israeli reality. This way, the name reflected the universal denominator of local communities and served localization processes. Moreover, it expressed frustrations and aggressions that intensified during the lockdown and gave voice to direct and indirect criticism, but it regulated these threatening voices by translating the jokes into Hebrew and applying them to local groups only. I will briefly conclude by saying that Side by side with its psychological functions to form and comfort, the parodic meme contributes not only to the establishment and consolidation of digital culture, but also to the formation of local digital communities. These virtual groups negotiate their symbolic capital with potential members, groups, and agencies by expressing ambivalence, reliance on, as well as reservation from competing types of discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Safi. Uh, I uh, can see that we have at least uh, one question. So, Wadek, please, your turn. Yeah. 
Thank you. There was it was great. It was a great talk. Wealth of wealth of examples. Thank you for this. Um, I have a general question concerning uh, parody because your your analysis seems to be um, focusing on parody, whereas uh, um, I've got an impression that some of the examples. Uh, if I might not be might be mistaken, but some of the examples seem to be more, uh, as you even mentioned, satirical or aggressive. So I, I thought um, parody is generally considered to be play, right, rather than rather than aggression. So that's my question. Okay, uh, at least in Israel, I think, but I think it's universal. We have a long tradition of satirical parodies, you know, from Jonathan Swift, actually, uh, to satirical uh, from the, the Age of Enlightenment. And actually, it goes, usually it goes together in Israel, this uh, um, uh, satirical nature of parodies. I think it's also true for, for, the, for the origins as, uh, of this genre. And uh, you definitely right. Uh, I think most of the uh, Examples have a satirical nature, and they have the militant characteristics. And but at least in Jewish tradition, and I think uh, beyond that, it, it go it does go together. Okay, thank you. That's that's interesting. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, I actually also had uh, a follow-up maybe on this is exactly this uh, aspect of the parody. Um, I, uh, when you showed the examples and, um, and they resonated a lot with Estonian examples and, and also uh, the Polish examples that I have uh, reviewed in an article and so on. And um, I was thinking how the notion of intertextuality uh, instead of parody would fit into this uh, a model or this this framework because parody i think also means an essential reference to the original uh, so that the original work is somehow uh, central there but in those memes i would say that uh, the children's books for example uh, they they don't really um, um, play a central role there but it's just this uh, image uh, something that uh, strings and uh, intertextual cord within the recipient so that they just recognize and, and uh, they play with the with those uh, known cultural symbols. Um, thank you for this important remark. Uh, I do think that intertextuality is also a way or a tool uh, to read uh, these means. However, I wanted to uh, emphasize the humoristic nature of, of you know, of this uh, joke or memes or internet memes and uh, for that I use the, the, the parodic nature and uh, the examples you you mentioned uh, of the children's books or games I think they are crucial uh, I think that it, it won't be you know the the, the incongruity pattern uh, you won't notice it without the image or without the, the citation so I do think it's it's crucial. I agree that some of them maybe it will be um, more you know more accurate to say to use intertextual reading, but then you take out the humoristic uh, um, uh, function or the humoristic uh, uh, background or the humoristic uh, pattern, and the parody actually. Um, is more connected with its affinity to humor. So that's why I, I usually use uh, parodic, uh, parodic reading. But uh, I think parody is, is, a, is a type of intertextuality. It's, it's, it's connected, it's not. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe one very short question because uh, I took some time from the beginning of Tafi's talk. So if you have. Any questions? But if not, then thank you again, Safi. And you. let's move on to our next speaker. And this is my good colleague, uh, Pirat Volait. 
She's a senior research fellow and also an executive manager of the Center of Excellence in Estonian Studies at the Estonian Literary Museum. And uh, she is interested in generally in minor forms of folklore, like riddles and proverbs and graffiti, uh, but also children's and youth folklore and internet and sports lore. And she has also written uh, uh, recently um, uh, also on humor. And uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, um, so, uh, to, uh, can you see my slides correctly? Thank you. Uh, to prevent uh, uh, the spread of the novel uh, coronavirus, uh, one of the most important uh, uh, restrictions was uh, replacing uh, in-person uh, learning uh, with different forms of homeschooling. During the first uh, wave of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, schools in Estonia uh, remained closed from uh, 16th of uh, March 2020 uh, until the end of the school year and uh, further periods uh, of countrywide uh, distance learning were imposed also throughout uh, this school, school year. Uh, the pandemic introduced uh, the need to specify forms of uh, learning and, uh, and define terminology uh, related to digital learning, uh, which uh, demonstrate uh, how teaching is carried out throughout the course. And uh, distance learning uh, is uh, the education in this means of students who may uh, not always be physically uh, present at the school. And today it uh, involves uh, online learning largely. Uh, in my paper, I will analyze uh, today memes uh, representing uh, distance learning in Estonia, uh, which circulated uh, uh, during the uh, uh, during the um, first wave of the uh, pandemic in spring uh, last year and highlight the different uh, perspectives uh, to distance learning, those of students, teachers and, uh, and parents. And I will address um, uh, the research questions, um, uh, which local and global features uh, do the memes represent? Uh, um, how uh, have students uh, drawn on cultural resources into these de memes and uh, whether and in which uh, ways uh, do the memes represent, for example, family relations? and uh, relations at school and which tendencies and uh, behavioral patterns related to distance learning are most prevalent uh, um, in the memes. Uh, distance learning uh, definitely has many advantages. However, during the pandemic, uh, there were discussions in various media uh, regarding the complexity of this method uh, of learning. Uh, soon after ensured discussions um, and uh, first preliminary studies on the impact of uh, distance learning on students' mental health, Estonian uh, youth mental health movement issued a summary of a questionnaire already uh, in April 2020 and highlighted uh, uh, the uh, typical um, uh, problems as well. Um, the theoretical basis um, of uh, my paper is uh, contemporary uh, meme theories uh, which uh, utilize uh, the concept of uh, meme to signify a certain type uh, of internet humor in the digital era. Memes representing uh, distance learning uh, may be uh, categorized uh, as school memes and uh, school lore since they interpret uh, and reflect uh, school life. Uh, Estonian folklorists uh, Mare Kalda and Astrid Duisk have been discussed memes as a certain instrument of uh, sub subculture and to cite uh, source um, interviewed for this paper, uh, young people uh, talking memes, visual memes, are used to discuss situation and people all deserves uh, the purpose of uh, managing the growing pains uh, since uh, coping in different, uh, different situations, especially in a crisis situation, serves uh, as a venting mechanism. Uh, the source of uh, my paper is the meme collection of the academic archives of the Department of Folkloristics at the Estonian Literary Museum. 
uh, which uh, during the pandemic has grown uh, by more than 2,000 uh, meme units uh, on various topics. And some material, especially text associated with a specific context, uh, were created as an outcome of a certain activity. And is here on a special uh, scrutiny. Uh, such an uh, endeavor uh, was the meme called uh, competition by distance learning uh, for school children in Tartu, uh, but was organized uh, by the Tartu Variku School in April uh, 2020, which resulted in five. Uh, uh, 141 means of the subject. And uh, since I have uh, participated in the international research project uh, of uh, COVID-19 folklore and humor, uh, additional uh, comparative material was used to provide an international context. And the joint uh, project is led by partnership of Giselinde Kuipers and uh, Mark Box and involves uh, researchers from more than 30 countries and the global corpus, about uh, 12,000 means, is available to all the project participants uh, for comparative research. Uh, the global aspect um, uh, becomes evident already in the meme templates uh, from online meme uh, generating environments. The templates uh, make use of popular elements and characters of pop culture and are borrowed uh, from well-known animations, TV series, comic books, uh, uh, movies or some viral sensations uh, popular among the youth. Uh, one of the most popular ones is the blank uh, template uh, featuring uh, the Canadian rapper uh, Drake uh, to express a pleasant and an unpleasant feeling, activity, situation and so on. Quite widely uh, exploited templates are those featuring uh, the motifs and characters of animated series such as uh, SpongeBob, uh, The Simpsons, Spider-Man, but also seeing as actors and uh, video game characters. And here again uh, uh, are very uh, popular meme templates, uh, running away balloon and distracted boyfriend among Estonian uh, school children. <laughs> Uh, highlighted, uh, highlighting such uh, intertextual references uh, diverges uh, information on this, uh, describing both global trends and local tradition. It is worth uh, noting that the visual uh, solutions lack references to Estonian uh, cultural texts, considering the large uh, number of memes. Uh, there are only a few, uh, such as uh, meme drawing on the children's television play Bratina and the photo in which uh, we may recognize uh, Estonian school uh, textbooks. Um, uh, in describing um, uh, in describing the folklore of uh, distance learning, uh, it is useful to apply uh, the term trickster. Uh, previously used in folklore studies and the mythology, trickster plays tricks and uh, pranks, uh, cunningly fools uh, others, uh, defies conventional behavior, uh, swindles and uh, is swindled, uh, invents new things and participates uh, in the creation of uh, culture. Uh, of the entire world. The figure of Trickster is highly ambivalent. Uh, he stands outside uh, uh, of uh, good and devil, transgresses uh, all boundaries, uh, uh, knowingly behaves in a wrong way and uh, is both clever and a fool at the same time. Uh, and in earlier international school humor, uh, the character of the Trickster is represented by an um, impudent schoolboy, school Little Johnny. It is known also in different nation folklore. Uh, many memes um, play on the di dilemma between uh, what a student actually prefers to do and uh, does in uh, secret instead of uh, uh, instead of uh, what needs um, uh, to be done. The most often mentioned uh, pleasant things to be are taking uh, a nap and uh, sleeping. Uh, the memes reveal a double life of, uh, and trickster-like uh, pretense uh, as here the students' real wishes and responsibles, uh, responsibilities are publicly uh, disclosed. Um, uh, students at the same time admit uh, their feelings uh, of uh, inadequacy, uh, being uh, stuck in a dire situation and uh, their failings. 
uh, here uh, certain um, tendencies or uh, patterns are revealed uh, that allow grouping uh, the memes in categories. In the memes, a student uh, is on top of the situation, but at the same time, here is uh, uh, in a quandary and has uh, only limited options available. And failures and mishaps come from life itself. Um, memes are often built uh, up on the opposition, me, others, uh, for example, teacher, uh, parents, classmates. Uh, uh, the distance um, learning experience during the pandemic is uh, polarized against uh, learning before the pandemic uh, uh, and uh, the so-called uh, normal life. According to uh, a general belief, uh, students uh, prefer not to go to school, but uh, very many uh, means indicate the opposite. Uh, they wish uh, to attend school in person uh, to do um, what you've just uh, um, uh, been uh, deprived of uh, is a very human uh, desire. Uh, and a large number of memes involve a, a complaint over too much homework. Um, uh, this is uh, in line with the survey results discussed before uh, concerning the issues of uh, distance learning. Uh, not all students can manage independent study successfully. At the same time, many could uh, be struggle with uh, managing also in a normal situation. Many memes uh, uh, convey um, and um, altogether opposite message, uh, there is too little homework to do and the main problems uh, with distance learning include being uh, bored at home and distance learning may even improve uh, uh, study results. A student's uh, social network during distance learning includes uh, parents, uh, especially when the latter are using home office for distance learning. Uh, in the memes uh, submitted to the competition, the parents' uh, perspective is revealed uh, through the eyes of students. Uh, depending uh, on a student's age, uh, studying at home inventionally um, uh, enhances um, the role of a parent as a um, supervisor. Uh, of the child homework and uh, the memes uh, also reflect this role of a substitute teacher, uh, supervisor, but uh, don't express uh, cooperation, but rather organizing supervision. Uh, very many uh, memes reflect the idea that the parents are fed up uh, with the situation and distance learning uh, may lead to parents uh, discovering uh, a vaccine much sooner than um, scientists. Uh, why mean? Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, a widely um, shared um, international meme um, uh, also shows how the roles are reversed. Uh, a distance uh, student or, or distance uh, worker, and uh, although the parents may be physically present at home, uh, the children must still deal uh, with uh, things and, um, and ma manage uh, on their own. And uh, here are a few other two uh, motives about uh, parents uh, that were spread in dif different languages during the pandemic. Uh, very many memes, um, however, either lack the image part of the universal template uh, in completely uh, superflows. Uh, the verbal text fully conveys the message. And the memes also reflect the image of a teacher who is mostly seriously focused on schoolwork, um, who is the one of uh, uh, to give assignments uh, and um, test uh, them, uh, demanding a great giver, uh, a disciplinarian. Um, uh, some memes uh, reveal that the challenges uh, that the teachers are facing, uh, a meme created um, in France, uh, for example, shows a highly popular motif of the band uh, on the Titanic, Titanic, uh, who continue to play until the ship was sinking. And uh, teachers are also frontline workers uh, who work until they collapse, regardless of a crisis or a capsizing ship. And um, my conclusions, uh, the meme material, which has been inspired by distance learning, is a fascinating uh, contemporary subject that uh, combines the 
challenging uh, COVID-19 pandemic and distance uh, learning as a characteristic feature of this period. Students who are the main uh, creators of the memes uh, regard the humorous uh, memes about distance learning as a form of communication, uh, which offers an alternative um, and uh, multifaceted uh, perspective on this important method of learning during lockdown. The Estonian material is largely based on internationally known universal meme templates uh, that have been uh, adapted to the local language and the cultural space. When investigating the social networks and uh, universal motifs reflected in the memes, it is important to rely on a complex content and contextual analysis. Uh, so, uh, and the stereotypical roles reflected in the memes can be analyzed figuratively uh, via the ambivalent trickster figure uh, known from earlier folklore studies. Uh, students are shown as uh, cunning go getters who use memes to discuss uncomfortable issues, mishaps, and problems. Uh, stereotypically, the image of a teacher, but also that a parent is uh, that of an authoritarian supervisor, a great giver from the student's perspective. Uh, this makes memes uh, a highly important channel for school children to make uh, their voice heard, either consciously or subconsciously. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Piret. Uh, that was uh, really a fascinating side of this uh, of the memes. And um, do we have any questions? Uh, Tafi has a question. Yes, please. Yes, and, and a request. Uh, thank you very much for this fascinating uh, presentation. I noticed that most of the figures in the memes were men, and it wasn't that surprising. I think almost all of them. Um, I, I wanted to ask, maybe you said that uh, in, in the beginning, uh, did you ask them to relate to school issues or they, they chose to do so? Uh, and uh, another question following uh, Ada's uh, remark, and maybe she will uh, say something about it later, I also noticed that um, they used um, uh, kind of old-fashioned uh, uh, intertext like The Muppet Show and all the movies, uh, you know, movies that uh, I grew up on them, like Home Alone and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say th something about it? It was surprising because, you know, I don't think my, my kids see The Muppet Show or I don't know where they take they are taking it from. And I also wanted, uh, uh, as a request, if you can share with us in the chat the, the questionnaire. I saw that you had in your presentation a link, right, mm -hmm. or something like that. It would be great to see. Yes, I yes, I will share. Thank you for these questions and uh, comments. Um, uh, so, yes, it was uh, as the main. Uh, um, it was a um, targeted. Uh, um, contest uh, uh, with special theme, uh, so the school issue was already uh, written to this uh, topic, uh, that's why uh, the material was uh, so so big. What about these old school memes? Uh, uh, actually, uh, this uh, um, age was very wide. It was uh, from five grade students to um, 20 years old. Uh, Students, I, I think one uh, one reason is this. It explains also maybe uh, older elder people uh, students uh, uh, used uh, this uh, um, uh, cultural text from their uh, young youngster period. Um, of course, indeed, Home Alone, for example, is a very uh, very popular was in Estonia as it uh, is shown every Christmas time <laughs> in state TV and uh, very different uh, channels. And also, I think that uh, uh, it um, influence uh, what kind of templates you can you can find in these uh, official meme generators, because uh, this, uh, for example. Um, the dominant of this Canadian rapper for me also is was quite surprising 
because I don't, uh, um, I, 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 I don't believe that uh, our school children uh, listen to him so much. But it is also maybe this official gener uh, mean generator. What, um, what, um, uh, how to say, uh, uh, influence the trends or so. And yes, uh, I will uh, uh, put uh, to chat uh, this uh, questionnaire web link also. And okay. You can see about the project. Thank you. And one more question, uh, Ida, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this was super interesting. And I think my question plays upon uh, Safi's comment that where do they get it from? <laughs> because that's one of the fun things about this meme culture. It's just so it comes from everywhere and it mixes different cultural strata. And it's, yeah, it's conf confusing. Yeah. And messy. But yeah. I have a, I have a, I have an interest in, in how these memes are translated because I remember when the first, uh, I'm Norwegian, I remember when I saw the first meme like with a picture and a text in Norwegian and that was kind of a, a change. Mm -hmm. I guess it was in 2012 or 13. It took for a long time we used English memes shared in Norway. So I'm wondering yeah. for the Estonian context, where do they the tran they translate from? Because you said one of the memes uh, you pointed to originated in France and a lot of them mm -hmm. originate in America. Do you see Russian or Finnish or I don't know, Swedish? Yeah, actually I had here also uh, uh, some uh, parallels from Belarusian, for example, for uh, our neighbor languages, it is very easy to translate uh, but uh, also uh, they just uh, take uh, some memes and uh, put their own um, mm, uh, text there. So uh, it is uh, very uh, uh, diversity of ambivalent also. Yeah. So, but but it is very interesting how much uh, English uh, uh, and of course Estonian uh, is influenced very much uh, according to memes uh, from English. That I can uh, uh, can say as uh, as also such result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for this comment. I also and very and much like and macaronic language also was used. Uh, that was also for me uh, very interesting. They mix different language. They mix uh, uh, columbours, uh, different um, word plays. Uh, that was also very interesting. And uh, they uh, they take over English uh, and put the Estonian language uh, word plays. Sometimes it is possible. Sometimes it's not. But it's very interesting what uh, what they choose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I also liked your uh, s this uh, little uh, citation that you said the, the y young people saying that maiming is their language. So this is uh, yeah, and language is a live thing and it evolves. So this is uh, yes, yes. That was uh, from the uh, interview I made specially for this presentation to get context, more context from uh, from uh, meme creators. Thank you. Thank you, Pirat. Um, so let's move on. Um, uh, as, and then the next presenter is uh, Franco Lai. Uh, he is an associate professor of social anthropology at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Sassari in Italy. Um, and uh, uh, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, turn on your microphone as well because we can't hear you at the moment. Okay. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I beg your pardon for my English because uh, I didn't speak English in the last two years. <laughs> um, um, uh, in Italy, the pandemic uh, has also led to a publishing, publishing pandemic. The myths I'm talking about consist in the creation of images as well as video that parody the political media discourse. 
uh, with respect to the pandemic and they circulate across social media networks. As regards the notion of meme, I refer to Richard Dawkins, uh, Luigi Cavalli Sforza, and uh, Dan Sperber works. I believe uh, this production and circulation of, him, of him memes is part of a broader infodemic uh, process. In the contemporary political arena, the use of memes is very important to reach a wider audience of potential voters. We might perhaps think that online communication with message uh, made of, of uh, images and text matched in a satirical and parodistic way is typical of left-wing partisan movements. The election campaigns in USA suggest a targeted, inventive and professional use of these means of communication, not, all, not only by progressive, but also conservative candidates. Memes have become an interesting research top topic, not, not only to understand how political communication has become pop, communication today, but also to understand how the, an, an endless number of people create mocking and irreverent messages using the material of mass culture, photographs, movies, songs, etc. The production of memes by a larger and definite number of people can be considered an act of cultural creativity carried out with manipulation and bricolage of various pre-existing um, elements of mass, of mass culture to produce new artifacts and meanings. Umberto Eco advocate a semiological guerrilla solution. solution. The goal was to bring confrontation not where communication starts, but at this point of arrival, implementing actions to bring the public to control the message and its multiple possibilities of interpretation. According to Manuel Castells, in fact, under certain conditions, citizens can become a creative audience capable of re-elaborating and manipulating messages. In my interpretation, the memes that circulate very rapidly online appear as creative and parodic responses to the official discourse. That of political power and the media, from this point of view, they appear as a form of popular and anonymous response to official discourse. Nothing seems to elude the attempt to parody official communication. On a site such as YouTube, we can see the parody of very successful films and television series, series often in the Italian regional languages. Even videos from adversaries campaigns are vastly present, present in these re reinterpretations. The ones by Apple, for example, seem to be among the most targeted. Targeted. Not even rock and Italian music escape the destiny of creative manipulation. As stated by John Fisk, uh, it seems evident that in contemporary mass culture, the response to dominant messages take on character of resistance. Social groups without power, according to Fisk, can take parts of the official message to use them against the dominant culture with an oppositional and a subversive function. It's questionable when, whether it's appropriate to laugh in such a complex and dramatic period. In this regard, David Le Breton said that laughter is not incompatible with outrage. Science memes circulate within arena of proximity relationships. Relationships, networks of friends, relative, relatives, work colleagues, etc. They contribute to building society or local uh, communities. As Le Breton says, a community of friends is saved through, through laughter in abundance. In fact, we can observe how the ability of memes to propagate is amplified by chats. In my view, uh, those, uh, those who produce memes in the era of pandemic re-elaborate pre-existing statements uh, were more or less evident elements of paternalism, community blaming, over, overly bureaucratic language, 
and even so-called respectability can be found. I also believe it is possible that rightly or wrongly, or ro or wrongly creatives allude to a certain authori authoritarianism. Irreverent jokes promptly target the meaning considered contradictory present in political speaks, speeches. Already in the early months of the pandemic, the dissonance between the opinion of, of experts and very often non-experts on television was evident. The daily, the, live, the daily live broadcast with updated data regarding the pandemic was born to inform public opinion. However, now that some time has passed, it's clear he has led in some respects to a dramatization on the ritualization of public communication. It should therefore not be surprising that the emergence of new memes followed the most agitated moments of public communication with respect to time, timing in identifying any inconsistencies. Uh, often, often during um, 2020, we uh, witnessed the diffusion of a catchphrase, as in the case of the continuous new rules and self-certification forms issued during the total lockdown of the country from March 2020 to, to, spring, to the spring that same, uh, the same year. During that period, a series of memes targeted the rumors, rumors concerning the ambiguous origins of COVID-29, the experts' continuous and discord, discordant positions regarding the use of gloves, masks, and sanitizers, which, by the way, were very difficult to find during the first phase. Every time a new self-certification um, form was issued, it stimulated an ironic vein, as in the case of the definition of relative, that is the person or people one was allowed to visit. Um, in the first figure, police officer advise a motorist to turn around. The implication is that he does need to reach his, his girlfriend, girlfriend um, possibly listed in the self-certification form, because he sh she surely see, sees you more as a friend. In the second, um, uh, there is a parody of um, uh, self-certificate. Uh, in this parody, the modalities of the stable affection are laughed at, uh, I'm waiting for an answer, or uh, made the, re the request but sent well, but I am still power hopeful. Is her best friend told me I have told me I have hope. I have to make my, my move today if you let me go. Um, or the sarcasm shift towards the opening and closing hours of cafe and restaurants and uh, shining um, uh, um, was a, a film. Uh, uh, very, very object of parodies in, uh, in Italy. Um, in this case, uh, um, the limit of, uh, uh, of, the, of the bars and restaurant was uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, 15 and 59 uh, 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 so uh, uh, this uh, um, this parody um, immediately after the vaccination campaign began, mass memes concerning vaccine and diverse side effects started to circulate. They are now legion, but I have selected only a few for that focus on the local rivalry between cities and, and small towns in Sardinia, like this. Uh, tragedy in Cagliari, a person gets the vaccine and becomes a citizen of Sassari. Uh, from the most beautiful island, the vaccine of salvation. 
Uh, in this case, the vaccine of salvation was Knusa beer, a well-known brand of Sardinian uh, origin. Um, uh, the case of more distinctly regional images suggests a, a predominantly local circulation of memes. When the media announced the precautionary suspension of the AstraZeneca vaccine on uh, March 15, 21, imagination was given free reign. A clearly Jamaican vaccine appears. Um, uh, his name was Rasta Zenica. Uh, Um, uh, the last figure, which are now the croissant, uh, croissants like decrease, um, the writing on a blackboard in a cafe in my city, Cagliari, was appeared in other Italian cities and testifies the, to the wonder Italian felt, felt for the continuous approval of decree laws. In conclusion, it can be said this is a characteristic of meme infodemic, of meme infodemic. The citizen response needs to the regulation continuously implemented during the, this first year of the pandemic. In any case, I choose rows of an irreverent and mocking nature, but never offensive. However, the criticism of memes is not aimed to a at a strictly political or, tech or technical aspects, but at what is perceived between the lines, sometimes artfully emphasizing the paternalism and so-called respect respectability of some rules, for example, those concern concerning unofficial emotional relationships. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we now saw uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, inherently Italian examples, which were quite uh, mm -hmm. different from what we saw in the previous uh, presentations. Uh, so I hope that you have questions. I don't have any um, uh, notifications in the chat, but yes, Fabio, please. Um, thanks, Franco, for this um for this very interesting and also amusing um, paper. Uh, I have only one question. Uh, did you collect also the Mimi produced by the Novax movement or circulating within the Novax uh, social media? Mm. Uh, thank you, Fabio. I understand. Um, um, no, because um, in uh, my networks, uh, I didn't see uh, Novax, uh, Novax memes. Um, uh, Novax memes, but uh, uh, parody of Novax uh, um, often. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, but not the campaign of Novax. Uh, I didn't mm -hmm. encounter it or see or see my in my networks. My networks are colleagues, uh, relatives, uh, or friends. Uh, um, so my point of view is um, um, uh, uh, how do you say? Uh, um, um, is uh, very tight. Uh, uh, unlimited uh, of my uh, or my friends, colleagues, uh, etc. That uh, I think uh, is uh, uh, of uh, left of uh, left um, of the left movements or parties, uh, etc. Uh, we say Novax are uh, often uh, on the right movements or parties or parties in Italy. Fabio, do you have a follow-up? Follow Excuse me? Uh, Fabio, you have no lo longer the question? Okay, so Tzafi. No, no. Okay, Tzafi. A very uh, brief remark. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned Fiske, I think, when you talked about minority groups that use uh, hegemonic uh, templates in order to... Uh, mm -hmm. um, 
voice their ideas, etc. I think also that the Sartor's notion of everyday practice uh, can be applied here to uh, mean uh, creators and uh, distributors. And also maybe Diane Goldstein's uh, on her book on AIDS legends, uh, when she calls this folklore uh, vernacular culture, uh, also can be um, interesting. Although when I used uh, this paradigm of vernacular culture, uh, the readers of my article on the same subject objected the idea, but uh, I, I thought that the, the notions of everyday culture, the folkloresque, the vernacular culture should be mentioned also in this context. Okay. Thank you for the comment. Um, Franco, do you have a... Um, um, I think in Italy the um, the situation is uh, original because um, uh, several uh, parodies uh, in uh, YouTube, uh, in cinema, etc. Um, was uh, in Italian language, but in um, uh, in um, in means uh, the language is often. Uh, uh, Roman dialect, uh, um, only in um, regional networks uh, is uh, in uh, local dialect, uh, uh, as in Sardinia. Uh, but uh, um, in um, networks uh, 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 like uh, uh, as uh, Facebook, uh, uh, etc., the language uh, or, uh, or memes uh, are uh, uh, Italian and uh, uh, very original thing, thing in, um, in a Roman dialect. And the Roman dialect uh, was uh, um, uh, the memes very widespread in, uh, in, uh, in Italy and uh, in uh, uh, online uh, web uh, sites. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I th think we have to move on. Uh, Franco, can you stop sharing your screen as well? So as I huh? introduce the next uh, speakers. Huh? The next uh, paper is a joint paper by um, uh, Dorota Brzezowska and uh, Władysław Chłopicki. Uh, Dorota is a full professor at the Institute of Linguistics at the Opole University in Poland, uh, while uh, Władysław Chłopicki is uh, associate professor at the Department of English Studies at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, uh, but also the professor at the Department of English uh, at Krosno State College. And they share a research interest in uh, humor and have written several articles together. So the floor is yours. Turn on your microphone as well. Dorota, we can't hear you still. Okay. Now is that... Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't hear Dorota. Can you try once again, Dorota? Just in... No. Okay, so can we... Can we start? Yes, you can, you can start, but uh, Dor we can't hear Dorota, so uh, you will have to do the talking and Dorota will uh, gesticulate. Okay, that sounds fine, right. Okay, so we are, we are interested in, uh, in um, uh, COVID uh, humor. We've been interested in uh, that for, uh, for some time together. We've published a couple of articles on on the, um, the subject um, and also took part in the Giselinda um, Kaupes project uh, that was mentioned by <coughs> Pirat earlier. Um, right, so um, briefly, since there's not much time, I'll, <coughs> I'll um, quickly go through the theoretical part and then uh, um, go into um, examples. 
uh, here's the, the goals. Whereas linguists, we are both linguists, so we, we're interested in mechanisms, uh, how uh, the um, intertextual humor or the um, uh, humor uh, which uh, refers to um, certain um, elements outside um, uh, the current COVID situation works. Um, uh, so we're interested in in, in uh, levels, shifts of point of view, and some uh, um, sophisticated uh, references. Well, this is based on the notion of sophistication, but um, uh, we'll just spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, here is the um, uh, database. Uh, we've been collecting that for uh, um, for several months uh, last year. Um, now, the notion of sophistication uh, comes first of all from Victor Askin and his idea of sophistication of humor, that is, and his idea of complexity. Um, sophistication is complexity and so sophistication as, as um, allusions. Uh, we didn't use the notion of uh, parody here, but um, of course it could be approached also in, in, in this way. Um, um, Salvatore Ataro talked about uh, um, humorous irony as detachment, and the idea of detachment indeed works here to, to some extent. Uh, you need to be detached to be able to play uh, with with the language and therefore uh, deal with uh, somewhat difficult um, situations. So that's uh, perhaps uh, some sort of explanation. And there's also a metalinguistic nature uh, to sophistication, which was pointed out by Juan Antonio Farabosco some time ago. Um, now, um, specifically as far as mechanism, we, we try to identify uh, the attributions of the point of view. So if you detach from, um, from a particular situation and refer to, to something outside, uh, especially for, to some uh, people outside or characters which are well known or less well known, um, and you attribute certain point of view of them, then uh, that's that's a mechanism which which has been systematically uh, used in in our data. Um, right, and outside references. This is pretty obvious. Now um, we also talked a little bit about intertextuality. Um, uh, the the purpose of 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 this will be to as as you've got it in in bold face here to help identify a person affiliate them with a the group enhance credibility of the speaker and deepen relationship and communicate feeling so that's basically a group cohesion kind of uh, um, mechanism now the definition the, the definition of memes was not has not been used here today so maybe this is useful um, the um, Limor Schiffman identifies memes as as groups, right? As collective um, elements, not individual memes, but but collections. And indeed, uh, uh, we've had uh, some examples of this even even today. Uh, but uh, we'll also mention um, some of these. Um, here is um, another approach um, cited in um, uh, the um, Lizzie Leinester's and uh, Pirat for Light's paper, um, which sort of links uh, sophistication from our point of view to, to some elements of humor. Uh, so absurdity, parody, um, popular events, icons, and juxtaposition. The idea of juxtapositions is well, simple but, but important in, in that case. Now, before um, moving on to um, examples, let me just mention the, this fact, which is somewhere in the background, that uh, humor in Poland was traditionally highly literary. There's lots of literature references uh, here. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so this is important. Then uh, media references more recently, uh, especially to films, which, which uh, we'll be referring to in, in the examples. Um, now, our focus here is in, on uh, references to life under socialism. Um, 
Paradoxically, it's a cultu culturally sophisticated period in recent Polish history. If you're interested, we can, we can discuss this paradox. Um, and uh, well, there, there's been research on nostalgia to socialism, post-socialist humor in uh, in the permitted uh, laughter volume uh, edited by Arago Crickman and Lisi Leinester. Uh, as far as memes um, and genres of memes in, in our data, we've, we've found quite a few um, uh, types, uh, but we, it's, it's difficult to present them um, as, um, at the moment, uh, but uh, we'll just give some examples. Okay, so let's, let's move on to, to the examples. Uh, the, um, the first one is the reference to the martial law. Um, um, this is the rationing card. Um, you can't pr probably see the um, uh, the Polish, but here's the um, uh, translation on the right. Uh, some of these uh, are pretty obvious. Uh, some of them are less obvious. For example, extra card for denouncing a neighbor. And then uh, the, the sort of prediction for the future is for soon, um, soon for everyone. Uh, well, here's some information uh, which um, uh, which was used here in this in this meme uh, reference to the martial law in 1981, and then um, uh, the the idea of attributing a point of view is used here. So the government, the present government, is attributed with with having introduced the regulations or planning to introduce the the um, uh, further regulations. Like like this, uh, notably uh, there was a box here in the middle of there. It's it's hardly visible, but uh, but it's there. Um, and boxes to take membership of a political party. Obviously, um, uh, then uh, then uh, your Russian uh, the boy well, is likely to depend on what party you belong to. Uh, that's another reference to uh, martial law. I think this one is pretty sophisticated. Um, so the general Jaruzelski here is is attributed as saying, so you're saying that they have closed the borders on the 13th, because this is what actually happened. And he smiles also as if offering a reassuring message that, that we have been through worse times. This is nothing. Um, and here, a range of references here, the new, new numerology references to the 13th. Because it's on the 13th of March, actually, that the pandemic closures, border closures came into effect. And, uh, well, the, the, there's an obvious, for the Polish audience, there's an obvious reference to, um, uh, to restrictions which, uh, which took place during the lockdown and during the martial law, with quite a similarity. And then the 13th of December, 13th of March, and then um, Friday the 13th, and then the 13th of May, the assassination attempt of against Paul, uh, Pope John Paul II, and then the Fatima revelations. There, there's a lot of it. So I think this is uh, this has been successful. I'm not sure if the all the members of the audience actually targeted audience would, would see this, but but still, um, I think that's that's effective. And now a range of uh, references to films. Um, this is a classical film from 1970. Um, here on the left, this is the, the current uh, meme. I have an issue to raise, says the speaker. I would like to ask how much longer will one need to wash oneself? And then on the right is the, the actual dialogue uh, from, uh, from the film, uh, where this same character actor asked uh, a question which uh, during the meeting of the, all the uh, participants of the of the cruise um, kind of irrelevant questions where he is supposed to sleep in his um, in, in, uh, on which both he is supposed to, to sleep. Um, this was a cult comedy. Here's a, the, a short uh, summary uh, for you if you're not familiar with this film. Um, um, a passenger gets on board of this cruise and then he's mistakenly taken to be a new entertainment officer. He accepts the role and organizes various events. The activities start with a general meeting where questions are asked and some of the participants are brusquely put down by officer running the meeting, a part of the meeting uh, in factories this is, and communist factories. 
Um, and then this this person was a ba- born actor, never who had never gone to a, a, a drama school. Jan Himmelsbach. He plays the character of a worker who is quite likely not to wash to, to want to wash too frequently. Again, it's a habit attribution to the working class kind of rural uh, rural habit of of washing just once a week. Uh, so there's lots of background uh, to this one. And here's another one uh, in the series, as you can see, there, there, there's been series as well, vaccination com- conspiracy. I have a certain issue concerning vaccination. Can one choose the vaccine with the Apple microchip instead of Microsoft One? I would like to be compatible with my phone. So that's, uh, the, this one has been quite, uh, quite popular, both conspiracy and, and this particular meme. Um, here's another one. I'm not sure, Dorota, are you there? Uh, can you speak or? I hope so. Can you? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Carry on. on. Ah, okay. Uh, So here is this uh, full uh, alternative uh, alternative film. So like reflecting the uh, way of living during socialism times that like a lot of people were uh, living together in uh, uh, some block of flats. Uh, and with uh, with di- different uh, family members uh, and so on together, uh, and uh, this uh, this kind of uh, stressful life uh, was connected to pandemic uh, times when uh, when uh, parents need, uh, we've heard about it. Yes, this distant learning and. Uh, distant teaching and so on, so uh, all of them uh, struggling like uh, parents and uh, uh, or, uh, and uh, and uh, children. Uh, t- uh, terrible times have arrived, so I have got a uh, previous, uh, previous slide there, but uh, yes, uh, yeah, so like terrible times have arrived, sir, people must wash hands, cook meals, talk to children. If things continue this way they will start reading books yeah so so it's uh this uh, Sorry, socialism I just, uh, connected with I, yeah i will just say that uh, i can see from this that you still have 34 slides that uh, all together but uh, yeah. you just yeah. have uh, yeah. Five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay, so maybe we will, yeah. So there, there are another some cultural uh, Highlander stereotypes. So, uh, so very, uh, very healthy style of life promoted by our, our uh, drink booze, sit on your ass, and no virus will uh, get at you. And and uh, once again, a kind of uh, coming back to to tra- traditional movies. But on the other hand, it's uh, interesting that uh, that really only thirteen percent of Highlanders are vaccinated now, versus thirty percent of the remaining po- Polish population. So somehow, not only other people think that uh, that Highlanders are very healthy and they believe in their uh, health from like fresh air and uh, yeah taking care of, like not stressful life and and drinking booze another one so there is uh, this uh, for a tank man and the dog so uh, some of you maybe remember the uh, the uh, the movie about uh, polish uh, yeah soldiers and yeah some some kind of dog the dog maybe is different but uh, but there is this uh, Sharik as, as, as a very characteristic name of the dog that belonged to those uh, four men and the tank, tank man. Uh, uh, and uh, one of those uh, memes that were popular uh, probably also elsewhere, that this Sharik, uh, the only dog in our 16-story apartment building, Sherry has been taken for a walk uh, 50 times today. Yeah, so, so this... Uh, this kind of uh, references that appear. And another, so uh, we've seen some uh, militia or uh, policemen uh, uh, there on, uh, on the uh, Italian uh, talk as well, yeah. So, so we connect uh, policemen with, uh, with socialistic times and, uh, but here 
uh, strong cultural references to the paintings uh, and there was a series of uh, Polish men uh, like appearing in different places uh, on our uh, on our paintings so like face masked and uniform policemen seems about to intervene uh, and the uh, 19th 18th uh, century uh, painting painter boy uh, so so uh, definitely this uh, this kind of allusion uh, to dumb policemen uh, uh, and old socialistic jokes why do militia men walk in pairs only one can read and write and the other one must keep an eye on the intellectual so maybe yeah so uh, and uh, maybe we'll go yeah to the to the next one it's it's once again uh, all those um closed spaces and the situation connected with the movie Jin uh, Świra. So, uh, so... Oh. Um. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, we are closing uh, shopping centers, we are closing ski slopes, we are opening ski slopes, we are closing ski slopes, we are closing hotels, we are opening hotels, we are closing hotels, we are winning with the pandemic, we are losing with the pandemic. Yes, fuck, fuck, fuck. So that was actually the short description of the situation was going on throughout the year and quite relatively, uh, like, like, quite nicely shown by our uh, hero from from the, the day of the nut. And uh, this is a kind of uh, twist on the American film uh, Groundhog uh, Day. So, but it's le less of a fantasy, more of a comment on the depressing uh, reality. Yes, yeah, so uh, conclusions, working on uh, coping uh, memes uh, that they display to major levels, the level of contextual uh, meaning. So the word of COVID and uh, Sorry, we are losing politics or or the lo local strength, strong uh, intertextuality. Yeah, uh, creativity and cognitive complexity. Uh, yeah, complexity. So maybe uh, yeah, these false attributions and a lot of uh, references, exager uh, uh, exaggeration. Uh, there, yeah. So. Uh, so um, and huge potential of cultural uh, memory that that's what we uh, seen in uh, in them yes that they are uh, reused to show hope unity of the community that survived different difficult times but is alive strong and determined to fight the pandemic and kill it and kill the fear with uh, the laughter and that's uh, that's all <laughs> I hope with. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wadek and Dorota, and uh, very happy to uh, hear you, Dorota, speak in person. <laughs> but it finally, finally happened. Uh, so, uh, uh, time for questions. Well, uh, until uh, people are thinking, maybe I will ask a question about the, um, the paintings or the art, uh, the aspect that was connected with, uh, with art. Uh, you had several examples, uh, well, maybe not here in this presentation, but I know that you, you have had a lot of examples with uh, Polish references to Polish art history. Uh, is there something specific uh, about that to the pandemics or, uh, or are these uh, templates uh, based on art history circulating in, uh, in Polish culture in general as well? Um, I think that's a, that's a good question, uh, whether they are uh, specific or not. I think but I haven't seen these, uh, actually these paintings being used as memes before. So that only appeared uh, last year. Well, there's a there's a famous one with uh, with a frenzy, right? So it's uh, that's a that's a painting um, which is displayed in in Krakow National Museum, 
um, or other paintings by Malczewski and, and others. Uh, um, I don't recall anything like this. So there must have been, uh, I suppose my interpretation that there must have been a tendency or um, um, a desire of uh, of the public or of the producers of the meme as well as the public to to sort of detach themselves from from this COVID uh, disaster. Uh, that's the way I can explain it. So hence we want to research this this area further. Why why has that happened? So distancing through uh, references to art is somehow yes. more effective than than using some other channels. You know? Okay. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I would have a well. Politics is not very uh, not a very safe area. Or referring to socialism, even right, which a lot of people actually um, um, they have at the back of their minds uh, the nineteen eighties uh, or or even earlier. Um, but all these references to films is also um, a fairly new thing. Um, I haven't seen that uh, before. Mm -hmm. I, there was, sometimes there were the references to, to films um, uh, um, in, uh, in, when some political situations which, uh, which happened earlier, mm -hmm. uh, but it was fairly rare. Now it has become uh, fairly standard. It's, it's, um, the, the series have, have grown, right? So. Yeah. I'm not sure I can fully answer that that question because that would require mm -hmm. uh, to to see what was happening before the pandemic and after it. But that's that's an interesting point uh, mm -hmm. that that we could maybe take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's another fascinating avenue of of research with some future uh, projects. Um, so let's move on to the last speaker. Uh, I'm afraid we are a bit short of time, but uh, I hope that you will still stay, stay here uh, until the end of this uh, panel. As our last speaker, Sverker Hilton Cavallius um, is going to present his research. He's a researcher and research coordinator at the Swedish Performing Arts Agency and associate um, uh, professor of ethnology at Stockholm University. And his research so far has focused on music, popular culture, memory, and dig digital culture. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, just wanted to check, do you see my slide? Okay, great. Um, over the last couple of years, I have conducted a study of how classical music is represented and negotiated in social media. This study is part of a bigger research project investigating notions and representations of art music within a broad range of film, TV, advertising, and digital media. Coming from ethnology and folklore studies, I approached the subject from day-to-day -day interaction in groups, accounts, and channels on Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, Instagram, and Reddit. Quite soon, though, I was struck by the way memes were circulated between platforms and integrated into interaction in various ways, allowing for demonstrations of both historical and technical competence within classical music, as well as competence in the performance of memes. Um, uh, in this slide, you see two uh, memes centered around Josef Karl Stieler's 1819 portrait of the composer Ludwig van Beethoven, exemplifying how classical music is brought into dialogue with, on the one hand, the image macro format, on the other hand, a range of references, both to contemporary heavy metal genres, uh, the hipster as a cultural trope, internet tools such as the hashtag, musical notation, and to the construction of classical music hits through the melody alluding to the opening of the fifth symphony at the bottom of the image uh, to the left here. Um, uh, this presentation was set out with a very short introduction to two aspects of classical music memes, competence and the issue of news lore. After that, I will show how the pandemic sent, entered the specific memescape through a set of boundary objects by looking at four examples. I will conclude by arguing that these objects met with a more internal knowledge of the classical music community to result in a kind of classical music news lore. Um, so, in my project, I approach memes as a form of digital folklore, following Anthony Back Bucitelli's suggestion that we view internet not as a way to mediate folklore, but as a site of performance. 
Memes depend on dissemination, creativity, and integration and interaction, demanding competence to fit genre with context and demonstrating a kind of intertextual richness that we also see in other forms of folklore. The same meme format can be used to portray political conflicts, historical events, celebrities, popular culture, or classical music. Thereby, the way a meme enters classical music humor can tell us something about perceptions of what classical music is to the followers of the groups and accounts I draw my material from. Even if it is hard to generalize about them, they seem to share an interest in classical music and comprise consumers, listeners, amateur musicians, conservators, students, academics, and professional musicians. To be intelligible, much of the shared material demands not only knowledge of historical composers, but also a minimum level of musical literacy, ability to read music scores, music terminology, and theory. Following Charles Briggs, competence in the performance of traditional verbal art is not only a matter of delivery, such as tone, gesture, enactment, prosody, and such, but also how genres adapted to context. The same competence is apparent in how memes are produced or shared and commented on. You can also act competently in the reception and commenting of memes. Here are opportunities to show that one has a sense of what kind of behaviors, expressions, and comments are appropriate in this context. I refer to this in terms of digital performative competence, having to do with one's ability to interpret and manage contexts, genre knowledge, rules and norm-breaking norms, and not least linguistic style. In the case of classical music, technical and historical subject competence becomes an equally important piece of the puzzle, partly because many posts become practically incomprehensible without them, and partly because all the tips about further listening, details about composers, own experience as musicians, and so on, can be seen as displays of competence that in these very contexts gain recognition and enhance one's status and credibility. Even if the classical music memes I've come across often address current popular uh, culture phenomena, they more rarely seem to take on current news events. However, the memes I will discuss here uh, seem to constitute what Russell Frank terms news lore, folklore that comments on and is therefore indecipherable without knowledge of current events. As Frank points out, there are also obvious similarities between the email jokes he followed in the early 2000s and the folklore by facsimile spread by Xerox copies and faxes, which Alan Dundas and Carl Pachter studied in the 1970s. Um, so, uh, what then happened with the classical music memes in the face of the pandemic, an event that arrived to us in a number of ways apart from the actual virus? I consider the pandemic as a cluster of boundary objects that are held together through context and references to, for example, pandemic, COVID-19, lockdown, quarantine, and so on. Objects in this context are stuff and things, tools, artifacts, and techniques, and ideas, stories, and memories, objects that are treated as consequential by community members, to quote uh, Bauker and Starr from Sorting Things Out, classification and its consequences. Boundary objects then, are plastic enough to function in the collaboration between different areas of expertise, yet can be stable enough to be productive inside these areas as well. Boundary objects characteristically move back and forth between more solid and delineated meanings and more flexible ones. As Susan Starr claims, they allow different groups to work together without consensus. In the context of the pandemic, we might think of work in the sense of collectively making sense or nonsense out of the many things that the pandemic is. With these thoughts in mind, I will now turn to a few examples of such boundary objects. This picture, based on the original print of the libretto to Mozart's The Magic Flute, and portraying Manuel Chicanera in the role of Papa Geno, was added by user Schwaltz to the subreddit Classical Memes on May 26, 2020, with the caption, Papa Geno in 2020. The overt message here is, in a way, simple. With rules about face masks, song will sound a lot different, more like a humming. But there are more layers to this. In Mozart's opera, Papageno's mouth is sealed with a lock after he has wrongly taken the credit for killing a giant snake, and he then hums apart before being released from the lock. The Papageno meme bears resemblance to both other memes that included adding face masks to pre-existing images, but also as part of a theme that I found on several occasions in the groups and accounts I followed, that is, the silencing of music. 
Music, as the performing arts in general, was hit hard by lockdowns, meeting restrictions and other government regulations, and memes became a way to express these pressures. At one and the same time, they point to the silencing taking place within the opera itself, to the silencing of musical performance in the time of the pandemic, and to disease prevention in general. Another aspect of limiting the spread of the virus were different hygiene recommendations, such as the use of hand sanitizers and washing techniques. The World Health Organization recommended at least 20 seconds with soap and warm water, which became a widely embraced standard in different countries. But exactly how long is 20 seconds? In many places, music was given the role of timekeeping. Swedish health authorities, for example, recommended singing Blink a Lilla Stjärna, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Such recommendations soon led to a multitude of music memes, such as the ones su suggesting for Hey Now, Hey Now, Nows for goth fans, likely referring to This Corrosion, a song by 80s rock band The Sisters of Mercy, or this one commenting on the format differences between different kinds of music. This one was posted on April 17th, 2020 in the Facebook group, the Classical Music Humor, and shows two hands wrinkly from what looks like they have spent a long time in water with a comment about the effects of washing hands for entire symphonies. A tendency in classical music memes is that they comment on aspects that unite classical music in relation to other kinds of music, usually in a humorous and drastic way. While other music can be portrayed as simple, classical mu music is seen as complex. And if, for example, pop songs are portrayed as monotonous and easy to learn, classical mu pieces in comparison are seen as demanding and require much practice, which is yet another, another theme that has been especially uh, prevalent during the pandemic. The prominence of aspects such as these, which from looking at comments seem to be widely accepted within the study groups, suggest that the memes here primarily serve a community supporting function. On March uh, 9th, 2020, The Verge reported about the hand washing lyrics generator, generator Wash your, your Lyrics, which also came to function as a meme generator of sorts. In the subreddit Classical Memes, Andy Freude from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was posted with a caption, I got bored and found a website, so I proudly present how to wash your hands with Beethoven. In another post from Instagram account Classical Music Memes, the beginnings of two music pieces, Caro Mio Ben and Erd König, are captioned me washing my hands in 2019 and me washing my hands in 2020, respectively. Both the portrayed pieces belong to a well-known classical canon, and likely many followers will, when reading the titles, recognize them and remember the music. The character of the two pieces couldn't be more different. The 2019 hand washing was performed larghetto, pre pretty slow, that is. In 2020, it was schnell, quickly. And while in 2019, it was done with sparsely placed notes, in 2020, the tempo was much higher with a metronome mark at 152, with densely placed triplets. The notation here works on two levels. Visually, it portrays the detail and accuracy in hand washing in the wake of the coronavirus as compared to before, while the music it notates symbolically represents hand washing in 2019 in a romantic light, while in 2020, it is performed under a looming threat. Advice on social or physical distancing were soon also spread medically. Recommendations for safe distances became the source of an outburst of online sharing, combining humor and health information. One of the first distancing measurements to find its way into classical music groups was a Japanese sign showing a double bass lying down, short, shared in early April in orchestra and double bass related Facebook groups. Soon enough, an English language version with a fully extended trombone appeared, posted in the Facebook group Classical Music Humor on April 12th. Memes about distancing were, however, not confirmed to instruments. Another meme showed three different ways to notate its C triad. Before coronavirus, in a single note stave, during lockdown, three staves with one note in each, and after reopening, together in one stave, but distanced. Uh, hygiene and distancing recommendations are thus in various ways brought into the language of classical music memes. Even if the primary aim of these memes is to entertain, the health information lives on. The fully extended trombone or hand washing to Andy Freude work as translations of health information from the public health discourse that is in a voice striving to be objective, informative, and not very entertaining. 
to a classical music meme discourse where fun is pivotal and like much other humor arises from the clash between different discourses. During the pandemic, a number of words entered colloquial language and familiar words gained new dimensions. In the groups and accounts I followed, one way to uh, one way these words were in, uh, incorporated in meme form were through posts teaching basic rhythmic patterns through pandemic-related words. One example was this COVID-19 rhythm lesson, alluding to a pedagogical practice posted in the group Classical Music Humor on March 29, 2020. Some terms here would be less obviously related to a pandemic. Toilet paper alludes to the hoarding practices seen across many countries in the early phase of the pandemic, and I need a hug reads as a comment relating to recommendations on physical distancing and quarantine. Help is given an extra dimension through the rhythmic pattern, a semi brev with a fermata, which seems more like an outdrawn cry rather than a short utterance. The COVID-19 pandemic came to us in the form of a range of boundary objects opening up for translations between virtually any contexts. Of course, the virus it's in itself, but also as graphs showing disease spread or death rates, which were also found in uh, my material. Recommendations on dist social distancing, face masks, and pandemic language. These enabled communication between, for example, medical expertise, health authorities, news reporters, communication staff at government agencies, and the general public. In the form of memes, these objects were combined with a more or less internal knowledge of the classical music community in the form of rhythm practices or references to musical works. The result was a kind of classical music news lore, simultaneously commenting on a current global situation, making use of the digital and mu musical tools at hand and creating humor with serious undertones. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sverker. That was really fascinating. I mean, this is something that uh, uh, I haven't had contact with uh, w within the uh, pandemics, but it really strikes a note <laughs> <laughs> to use your play on language. And I see Ida has a question, please. Uh, thank you very much, Sverke. This was super cool. And I think this is an important way to do research because you're doing it within a certain subgroup, right? So you can mm. perhaps see how it is shared in a more like detailed manner. And I was wondering, because these memes, you have to have some, you said so that you have to have some kind of background in music to understand the humor. And that's a very important part of humor as the function uh, to create groups, in groups and out groups. And uh, could you just uh, explain a little bit where these are shared? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, so they are shared on uh, in different um, uh, Reddit uh, threads. Um, in uh, I have followed accounts on Tumblr and Pinterest, and uh, uh, some of these are just aimed at generating classical music memes. And so sometimes people will also uh, sort of frame their memes by saying. Now I'll give it a try, sort of people trying to make a meme for the first time and, and, and see how it works out. Uh, so, uh, um, and, th and then of course, uh, Facebook groups. Um, some of these are uh, general classical music groups and some of them are, are classical music humor groups, um, which means that uh, especially the classical music humor groups integrate b both uh, memes, but also these, uh, short snippets that can be found on YouTube with people making coronavirus uh, uh, classical music. Uh, for example, the coronavirus etude was one of these quite popular ones. Uh, so it's, so it, it's, it's kind of a blend of different strands of, of, of humorous content. It's also interesting to see that uh, this kind of humor really, uh, this uh, uh, music-related uh, COVID humor really circulates in the in those groups only and and rarely gets out. Uh, uh, I guess so, at least because I, I know one Estonian example that that was only circulated among people who sing in choirs, mm. and I didn't. Uh, nobody outside that that group uh, knew it. So mm. probably okay. this also goes with your material, your data yeah. that doesn't really spread very easily. Mm. Although it's it's really uh, fascinating, humorous material. Mm. 
Any other questions? I have a small question. Okay. So I want to make sure these groups are international groups, right? Yeah. And and I also wanted to ask if you received any videos with music on them and to ask if the subject of uh, players that were unemployed during this period, uh, if it was raised in these means, if, if, if you saw humor about that subject. Yeah, that, that's a really good question because, I mean, that has been uh, all over the place, uh, I mean, in a, on a more serious note. Um, uh, people discussing uh, the consequences of, of shutdowns uh, of stages and so on. So, so it's, it's definitely been a, a very important um, uh, frame in discussions um, elsewhere. But I have not seen it as a common theme in, uh, in yeah. these memes. Um, um, but uh, as, as I said, I, th I, th I think that the way to interpret the Papageno meme is as a comment that, that, that comments on on what happens when music is is silenced? Not only the the, the intertext with the with the mouth lock, but but also that that aspect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I know we have uh, exceeded uh, the time limit given given to us, but there was also an interesting. There, were, Ida had a comment in the chat, and uh, and I think. Uh, there would be a lot to talk about or to uh, to discuss still, but uh, I guess we now have to leave this panel and maybe uh, uh, if we convene again, uh, I hope many of you can also join the next uh, part of this panel uh, that starts at uh, two o'clock, that is in two hours or so, that uh, maybe then we can uh, also address these questions. I think they mostly, uh, it's about this uh, global and, and local and also how uh, language, uh, what what um, function it plays, in what language the, the memes are and where the templates are borrowed and so on. So it, it really creates this interesting tension between local and global and how this is resolved in each country is different. And it would be really interesting to, to know or to find out, to, to discuss um, this across cultures with all of you. So uh, let's uh, meet again in two hours. And thank you everyone for attending. And thank you, uh, thanks again for the speakers. It was a great session. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lucy. Thank you very all much. Right.